Greek mythology is full of terrible tales, and this episode includes murder, adultery, incest, and cannibalism. This one will take us to the Greek city-state of Mycenae, a place the pod hasn't gone to in a while, probably not since the Heracles episodes, and will tell the story of the brothers Atreus and Thyestes. The last few episodes focused on the city of Thebes, and told how a terrible curse, or even a collection of curses, brought doom to multiple generations of the royal family of Thebes. My favorite part was probably the conflict between Ateocles and Polynices, the sons of Oedipus. This fight between Ateocles and Polynices led to a great war that brought other cities into the mix. But while many cities appear in Greek mythology, with the exception of Thebes, none of them are implied to be nearly as powerful as Mycenae. So why didn't Mycenae get involved in the Theban Wars? Well, it wasn't for lack of trying. After securing the support of Argos, Polynices did travel to the neighboring kingdom of Mycenae to seek that city's powerful support for the war as well. At first, the Mycenaeans considered helping, but when they consulted their oracles, they learned that Zeus was opposed to their involvement. So instead, Mycenae stayed neutral. But I propose there was another, secondary reason for Mycenae not getting involved. At the time, the city-state was facing its own problems, and those, like with Thebes, came in the form of a terrible series of curses and sibling rivalry that was tearing the royal family apart. These curses go all the way back to the Greek hero Pelops, who was the founder of Mycenae's ruling dynasty. A series of curses plague the subsequent generations of Pelops' family. It started with Pelops himself, but each curse cascaded down to the next generation, causing them to commit their own crimes and curse the family all over again. Let's start with the original curse. I covered the myths of Pelops in the Pelops episode, so I won't go into too much detail here, but here's a quick summary. Pelops traveled to Pisa in Elis, Greece, to try his luck with Hippodamia, the daughter of Pisa's king, Onimaeus. Onimaeus was an unsavory character, and challenged all of Hippodamia's suitors to a chariot race. If they lost, he killed them. Pelops won, and in several sources for this story, he was partly helped by Onimaeus's charioteer, Myrtilos. Myrtilos sabotaged Onimaeus's chariot, and the king was dragged to his death after being tangled up in the reins of his own horses. Afterwards, Myrtilos tried to rape Hippodamia. Pelops kills him, and Myrtilos curses Pelops. I'm not exactly sure how this curse affected the later generations of Pelops' family. Generally, in the myths, Pelops had to get purified for the death of Onimaeus and Myrtilos, so this curse should have at least been stopped. It's possible, though, that it led to a bad family life for Pelops. Later, Pelops and Hippodamia have children. Two of them are the brothers Atreus and Thyestes. It is these brothers that manifest their family's curse the most. Chrysippus was another son of Pelops, but not with his wife Hippodamia. Even though he was not Pelops' son with his wife Hippodamia, Chrysippus lived with Pelops' entire family. Pelops' wife did not like Chrysippus, and she convinced Atreus and Thyestes to kill him, since he was a threat to their claim to Pelops' throne. The actual murderer is different in different versions. Sometimes Atreus and Thyestes kill Chrysippus, sometimes just Atreus. In one version, the two brothers refuse, so Hippodamia does it herself, and tries to frame the whole thing on someone else by placing the murder weapon in the hand of a sleeping man. But Hippodamia messed up. Chrysippus was not actually dead, only slowly dying. He was able to tell Pelops who the true murderer was before he died. What followed was an end to Pelops' marriage to Hippodamia. The king either banished her, or she killed herself. Atreus and Thyestes were also exiled. Like so many other heroes, they left their homeland and went to Mycenae to seek refuge. According to the Greek writer Apollodorus, when the brothers arrived, they found the city under the control of a man named Stenelos. 
Stenelos was a son of the hero Perseus. Besides killing the Gorgon, Perseus also built a kingdom for himself around Mycenae. When he died, his sons inherited the kingship for the different cities he ruled over. Stenelos became king of Tyrans, but when his brother, Electrion, who ruled Mycenae, died, Stenelos took over the city and exiled Electrion's preferred heir, a man named Amphitryon, who would later become the father of the hero Heracles. I covered this story in the first Hercules episode. Anyway, Atreus and Thyestes arrived in a Mycenae ruled by Stenelos. He accepted the brothers as retainers, and according to Apollodorus, sent them to a town called Midia to act as his vassals. With their new land, things were looking on the up and up for Atreus and Thyestes. Atreus married a beautiful woman named Aeropi. Aeropi was a royal princess from Crete and was the granddaughter of King Minos. She was a disgraced princess, though. According to the playwright Euripides, her father found her in bed with a servant, an unusually straightforward scandal for Greek myth. She was handed over to the sailor hero Nauplius, who was told to drown her in the sea. He took pity on her, though, took her to Greece instead, and set her free. Eventually, she married Atreus. Two of their sons were the brothers Agamemnon and Menelaus. This is the usual makeup of Atreus's family, and it goes back at least as far as the 8th century BC, including being the version Homer uses in the Iliad and Odyssey. However, in another tradition, also going back to the Archaic period, there is an extra generation. In this one, Aeropi is married to a son of Atreus named Plisthenes, and he is the father of Agamemnon and Menelaus. And the brothers were later adopted by their grandfather after Plisthenes died. And then in a third tradition, there is no extra generation, and Plisthenes is just another name for Atreus. So there's something weird going on here. For the remainder of this episode, I'll leave out Plesithenes. At the same time as Atreus, his brother, Thyestes, had two sons. Their names are Tantalus and Plesithenes, according to the Roman poet Hagenus. Thyestes also had a daughter named Pelopia. Thyestes' wife's name is not recorded. Years pass, and Atreus and Thyestes' overlord Stenelos died and his whole kingdom went to his son, Eurystheus, to rule. This is the same Eurystheus who Heracles performed his twelve labors for. I covered those adventures in part two and three of the Hercules episodes. After Heracles completed the labors, Eurystheus held a grudge against the hero. This remained even after Heracles died, and Eurystheus kept his grudge alive by fighting against Heracles' many young sons. Eventually, he went to go fight them personally, and left Atreus and Thyestes to temporarily rule Mycenae while he was away. Too bad for Eurystheus, he was killed and never returned. It's at this point that the trouble between the brothers Atreus and Thyestes begins. This was a very popular story in ancient Greece, and there are numerous sources for it. Homer's Iliad doesn't really mention the drama, but the Odyssey does go into its fallout. The Athenian playwrights Aeschylus and Euripides both covered it in the 5th century BC, as well as the later Roman playwright Seneca almost 500 years later. The mythographers Apollodorus and Hyginus also tell the story. Anyway, on the death of Eurystheus, an oracle said that a descendant of Pelops would rise to the throne of Mycenae. But who? By this time, there were quite a number of descendants of Pelops around. Atreus and Thyestes, of course, were two of them, and they both were already there, sharing power. But only one could become king. To strengthen his claim, Atreus pulled an old trick. He prayed to the goddess Artemis for the finest possible lamb, and promised to sacrifice it to her and hang its skin in her temple. When a magnificent lamb with golden fleece appeared, Atreus made an age-old mistake. He decided he wasn't going to sacrifice the lamb after all. Instead, he wrung its neck himself, and deciding to keep its skinned fleece, 
he placed it in a special box and hid it away. In another version, it is the god Hermes who provides the golden lamb to Atreus, and the god has an ulterior motive in doing this. He wanted revenge on the family of Pelops for the death of the charioteer Myrtillos. Whatever the origin of the lamb is, Atreus decided to keep the treasure and stored it in a box. Only two people knew the location of the lamb's box, Atreus and his wife Arope, but not for long. Because at the time, Arope was also having a passionate affair with Atreus's brother, Thyestes. In Aeschylus's play Agamemnon, the coming feud between Atreus and Thyestes was said to originate from this affair. Arope secretly had the lambskin moved, without anyone knowing, and turned it over to Thyestes, who also hid it away somewhere else. Later, Atreus and Thyestes began negotiations for who would become the king of Mycenae. Thyestes suggested that whoever had the golden lambskin granted by Artemis should become king. Atreus, thinking he still had it safely stowed away, agreed. Imagine his shock when Thyestes produced the lambskin right in front of him. It looked like Thyestes was about to be appointed king. But right in time for Atreus, Zeus, the king of the universe, intervened. Zeus was very fond of Atreus, and told the human to propose a condition on which he would become king instead. Atreus suggested if the sun moved backwards across the sky, and set in the east instead of the west. Thinking this was completely impossible, Thyestes agreed. He didn't count on Zeus, though. The god made the sun move backwards. People were amazed. Atreus's immortal patronage was on full display. He ascended to the throne of Mycenae, and his first decree was to exile his brother Thyestes. You might think with his brother gone and the Mycenaean throne growing warm underneath him, Atreus was ready to move on and occupy himself with ruling his new kingdom. Yet, there was something nagging at Atreus. Something he couldn't move past, no matter how hard he tried. How did Thyestes manage to get his hands on that golden lambskin? Eventually, Atreus put two and two together, and learned of his wife Ariope's affair with his brother. He drowned his wife for betraying him. Next, Atreus sent out ambassadors to go find Thyestes and deliver a message. The message was that Atreus wanted him to return to Mycenae. Sure, they had fought in the past, but Atreus wanted bygones to be bygones. He requested Thyestes to join him for a feast he'd never forget. Thyestes returned, and he brought his sons too. While Thyestes was distracted, Atreus had his sons slaughtered, their bodies butchered, cooked, and served to Thyestes at the feast. When they were sitting together at the long feast table, Thyestes told Atreus how delicious the signature dish was. Atreus took the lids off of some other pots and showed Thyestes the heads, hands, and feet of his two dead sons. To rub it in, he told Thyestes that the parts of his sons he couldn't see, he'd already eaten. Horrified, Thyestes called down unspeakable curses upon Atreus and his family, but Atreus's overkill revenge was complete, and with the sounds of Atreus's laughter echoing through the palace halls behind him, Thyestes fled from Mycenae yet again. Now it was Thyestes's turn for revenge. To secure guidance on how to go about it, Thyestes consulted an oracle. The oracle gave him some disturbing, but still consistent with the story so far, instructions. The oracle told Thyestes he needed to have sex with his own daughter, Pelopia, and father a son. Pelopia was living in Sicyon, a city in central Greece. She was sent there previously to be safe from the feud between her father and uncle. After hearing the oracle and obsessed with revenge against his brother, Thyestes went to Sicyon. He found Pelopia performing a nighttime sacrifice to the goddess Athena. Thyestes watched unseen from the shadows. As the ritual neared its end, Pelopia slipped on the sacrificial blood that had dripped off the altar and stained her dress. After the final rites were completed, 
she went alone to the banks of a nearby river, stripped off her dress, and began to wash it in the current. Keeping his identity secret, Thyestes snuck up behind her, pounced, and raped his own daughter. In the struggle with her attacker, Pelopia managed to knock Thyestes' sword off of him. When he left her there, in shock lying in the mud by the riverbank, he forgot it in the bushes. Shortly afterwards, Pelopia left Sicyon and went to the court of another king named Thesprotus to ask if he would look after her. By chance, there, she met her uncle Atreus, who happened to come visit. It had been many years, and Atreus didn't recognize her. He didn't realize he was related to Pelopia, and just assumed the pretty girl was a daughter of Thesprotus. He asked Thesprotus if he could marry his daughter. Thesprotus agreed, probably because Atreus was offering a generous bride price, and decided not to tell Atreus that Pelopia was not actually his daughter, or that she was already pregnant with some unknown man's son. Apparently, Pelopia never mentioned it either. So Atreus took Pelopia back to Mycenae, and they were married. She hid her pregnancy from her new husband, gave birth to a son, and left the baby exposed to die in the wilderness. Of course, as you may be used to by now if you've listened to past episodes, the exposed baby did not die, but was instead suckled by a goat. Eventually, he was found by Greek shepherds and taken home out of the woods. King Atreus heard stories of the newly found feral child. He decided to adopt the boy, naming him Aegithus. Years pass, and everyone grows older. Atreus' sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus, who were by this point young men, encountered Thyestes at the Oracle of Delphi. They arrested their uncle and brought him back to Mycenae for a meeting with Atreus. As the Roman poet Hegenus recounts, Atreus sent his adopted son Aegithus to the meeting. The young Aegithus wore a sword, and Thyestes recognized it as the one he lost when he raped his own daughter, and he asked the boy where he got it. The boy said his mother gave it to him, and when Pelopia was also brought to the meeting, Thyestes revealed the terrible truth. Pelopia learned she was raped by her own father. Aegithus learned he was actually Thyestes' son. Pelopia snatched the sword from Aegithus, pretending she was shocked and wanted to examine it, and then she committed suicide by stabbing herself with it, so great was the horror she had about what her father had done. Aegithus then swore allegiance to Thyestes. To our modern ears, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but in the topsy-turvy world of Bronze Age Greece, Aegithus is honor-bound to his family, his true family, and that is his biological father, Thyestes. Aegithus was now tied up in the blood feud, and his adopted father, Atreus, was now his enemy. So Aegithus took the bloody sword and showed it to Atreus, claiming that Thyestes was dead. But as soon as the king was distracted performing a sacrifice to the gods by the seashore, Aegithus made his own way over the slippery cliffs and through the salty spray. He plunged the sword into Atreus's back. And with that, the prophecy Thyestes received was fulfilled. The rape of his daughter had in fact led to revenge against his brother. With Atreus finally dead, and his newfound son as an ally, Thyestes was free to seize the throne of Mycenae. He solidified his hold on power and banished Atreus' adult sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus. Now homeless, they traveled to Sparta to seek refuge with its king, Tyndarius. That is where they eventually ended up, anyway. They may have stayed at other royal courts first. John Zetzes, a Greek Byzantine scholar living in Constantinople in the 12th century AD, preserved lots of information on earlier Greek mythology. He recorded that Agamemnon and Menelaus also went to Polyphiades, king of Sicyon. That's where Pelopia was sent before, and that they also went to Aeneas, of Caledonian boar hunt fame, before the two brothers headed to Sparta. Once in Sparta, time passed. Agamemnon and Menelaus both married Tyndarius's two daughters, Clytemnestra and Helen. 
It's not exactly clear to me when this would have happened. It's mostly sources from the 5th century BC and later that refer to this part of the story. The earlier sources instead only tell about a drawn-out period where various heroes came to Sparta to try and marry Helen, before Menelaus proved successful. But Menelaus is an exiled prince. That doesn't make his prospects very good in a courtship that compares him with other princes. So maybe the two of them were married later. Agamemnon's marriage to Clytemnestra may not have been straightforward either. A 5th century BC play, Iphigenia at Aulis by Euripides, adds a new detail, that Clytemnestra was already married to none other than another son of King Thyestes. Well, what did Agamemnon do? According to Euripides, he killed the husband and their newborn son, and then married Clytemnestra. Looking to his ties of marriage or just fond friendship, Tyndarius wanted to help Agamemnon and Menelaus in their fight against Thyestes. With the support of Tyndarius, Agamemnon and Menelaus marched a Spartan army to Mycenae. Their uncle Thyestes and their half-brother Aegithus saw the rows of Spartan spearmen and knew they had no hope. They were driven out of the kingdom. Agamemnon took over as king of Mycenae. Menelaus returned to Sparta and eventually became its king after Tyndarius grew old and retired. So that is the rather convoluted and not at all wholesome way Agamemnon and Menelaus each became the kings of Mycenae and Sparta. While parts of this story are referenced in the Odyssey, Homer's Iliad glosses over the whole thing almost entirely. Instead, kingship of Mycenae is described with the passage of a royal scepter. Homer says the scepter was fashioned by the craftsman god Hephaestus, who gave it to Zeus. The king of the universe, in turn told Hermes to gift it to the hero Pelops. From Pelops, this divine treasure went to Atreus, who left it for Thyestes, who in turn left it to Agamemnon to carry and be lord over all of the surrounding Argolid. The Iliad, at least, makes the transfer of power sound all rather peaceful. But why? Well, it's important to remember that Homer was an accomplished and talented poet. He'd have to be, to be so celebrated in ancient Greece and even today. Great storytellers know they can't just cram their work with exposition and background information. It has to be relevant to the story they're trying to tell, or the themes they're trying to discuss. Sharing the conflict between Atreus and Thyestes doesn't work in the Iliad, but it does work in the Odyssey, for reasons I'll discuss when the pod gets to those poems. For now, behind the Iliad's nice story, as you've heard, there is plenty of bloodshed, tears, and strange alliances. Greek mythology really is full of some terrible tales. This episode is going to be the last for a little while. It brings the pod to the end of the latest season on Greek mythology. The previous 30 or so episodes started at the approximate beginning of the Greek Age of Heroes, and covered the founding of several ancient Greek city-states and famous heroic dynasties. There were heroes who fought fearsome monsters and went on strange adventures. There was love, betrayal, and complex family relationships. And there were a series of events, the voyage of the Argonauts, the hunt for the Caledonian boar, and the wars against Thebes. These brought numerous heroes together to struggle towards a common goal or against a terrible curse. But in the midst of the last few adventures, I was also setting the stage for what comes next. Heroes like Peleus, Diomedes, Agamemnon, Menelaus, and others are all going to appear yet again because it's time for a new generation, and a new generation with its own big adventure. The next time I come back to Greek mythology, and I'll probably change it up and cover a different culture for a bit first, will be the lead-up to the Trojan War, the conflict itself, and the aftermath. So stay tuned. If you're enjoying these podcasts, pick one friend, or maybe two, and send them a link to it right now. As always, thank you for listening. 